Hi everyone, welcome back. You know, virtually everyone is familiar with the story of American slavery. American slavery was a brutal, dehumanizing forced labor system popular across much of the American South, which denied the enslaved person not only pay for their work, but it also denied them education, equal rights, self-determination, pursuit of happiness, and even basic human dignity. What's not as well known is that in the North, there was also a labor system which took advantage of people with no political power and virtually no voice. These people were typically young unmarried women and even young girls. Today on Much Ado About History, we're going to examine the life of a mill girl. By the middle of the 1800s, the most popular cash crop, which is a non-food crop, in America was this, cotton. Cotton was grown in much of the American South, and cotton is probably the crop that is most closely associated with American slavery. It's a plant that requires a lot of work, a lot of labor. The cotton has to be seeded, weeded, it has to be tended, it has to be harvested, and at harvest time, it has to be separated from its seed. It has to be processed, and it takes a lot of work to do. Well, a lot of this cotton, once it was processed, was being sold to other countries, perhaps France or uh, England. It was very much in demand there. But a huge portion of all the cotton that was being grown and processed by slaves, enslaved people in the American South, was actually being sent up to the northern states to be turned into this, cotton cloth, in some of the earliest factories in the United States, textile factories. Textiles are simply cloth. People were still making their own clothes, but instead of having their own spinning wheel at home, it was becoming more popular to buy already made fabrics, already made cloth. Well, the demand was being met in northern factories that were turning this, into this. And the workforce that they used to do this were not enslaved people, but were young girls, usually unmarried women, often whose families owned farms. And until they got married, they were somewhat of considered a burden on their family. And they were often sent to these factories in the north, in places like Lowell, Massachusetts, to earn a living until their parents could find for them a husband. That's what we're going to look at today the life of a mill girl. So I've got a few resources that I want to share with you here as we examine the life of a mill girl. And first let's start with the easiest one. Let's take a look at the photograph here. All right, in the photograph we see exactly what a girl working in one of these textile mills would have looked like. We see how she would have been dressed. We also kind of get a good idea about her age from this photograph. I mean, if she were someone that were alive today, she would certainly be school age. She looks like she's, you know, somewhere between maybe 10 to 13 years old. So she would certainly be in school today, getting an education, getting the required education that all children do nowadays. Um, but back in the, you know, mid 1800s, School attendance was not required in all states or certainly beyond a certain age. And many families made the choice to send their children to work to simply help the family. So she is someone that probably is, like I said, in that neighborhood of 10 to 13 years old. She probably has had just a little bit of schooling. Um, she looks relatively, I mean, even though she's maybe as old as 12 or 13, she looks maybe even a couple years younger. Maybe her growth is a little bit stunted because of the hard work, the labor that she's had to do. It's hard to tell in this picture, but um, her hands here, her fingers and hands, um, they're a little bit raw and swollen just from the work of constantly having to deal with the cotton fiber and the cotton thread, taking it on and off the spools. We also have here a daily schedule. It says timetable of Lowell Mills. So Lowell 
is a town in Massachusetts. And that was one of the first so-called factory towns. It was completely set up around the textile industry and it was set up with a system of factories, many of the employees being you know, similar to this young girl. And these girls would have lived in dormitories under supervision you know, with many, many other girls their age or maybe a little bit older or a little bit younger. But this tells you about the length of their day. It says first bell, 4.30 a.m. So that's when they're getting up. Second bell, 5.30. So maybe in that first time period, they um, you know, got up, got dressed. Maybe they had breakfast. Maybe they you know, said prayers or something like that. Third bell, by 6.20, they're now, they've completed a lot of those early tasks in the day, and now they're off to work. Okay, so they've gotten up. They've gotten dressed, they've had breakfast, maybe there was a prayer service or a you know, morning church service or something. Now by 6.20 in the morning, they are off to work. And they're going to work almost a six hour shift. It says they'll ring out next at 12 o'clock noon. And it says dinner bells. Well, dinner is the meal that we today call lunch, like our midday meal, they used to call it dinner. And so they would have worked pretty much solidly from 6.20 to noon. So about five hours and 40 minutes. And then there's a break here for lunch from about 12 noon to about 12.35, and then they're ringing back in. So they worked their first shift, now they're working their second shift from 12.35 until evening bells ring out about 6.30 p.m. So almost another six hour shift. So they're working somewhere on a typical day almost 12 hours per day. And often that could sometimes go longer. Some factory towns and some mills, it was not uncommon for girls to work as much as 14 hours in a day. So it's a very, very hard shift. It's a very boring and tedious kind of lifestyle and it's done by these young girls. Another source I'd like to share with you is a quote. And the woman quoted, her name is Sarah G. Bagley. Sarah G. Bagley was someone who had worked in some of these mills, in the Lowell system and you know, other textile mills like that, as a young girl, and then even as an adult woman. And later on, she became an advocate for workers' rights. She became a labor organizer. Today we would call her something like, you know, like a labor union leader. And she wants to, you know, increase pay, increase the quality of the working conditions, and lower the amount of the workday. So in her quote, she's going to tell you a lot of things. She's going to describe to us what the system is like, what the work is like, how long the workers would have worked for. So it's also tells us a lot about. the rights of women, or sometimes the lack thereof, or the role of women in society. Oftentimes, especially young girls, they're coming last in the family pecking order. Um, maybe their fathers or mothers or older brothers, they're considered more important and their futures are more important. And we'll kind of see just where young women would have fallen back then. Okay, so let's take a look at this quote here. And she says, is anyone such a fool as to suppose that out of the 6,000 factory girls in Lowell, 60 would be there if they could help it? Okay, so she gives us a number. So she's telling us that there are somewhere around 6,000 factory girls working in just this one factory town of Lowell, Massachusetts. Whenever I raise the point that it is immoral to shut us up in such a close room 12 hours a day, Okay, again, so they're confirming like this long 12 hour workday. In the most monotonous and tedious of employment. So she's saying the work is boring, it's repetitive, it's the same thing every day. Tedious, boring, monotonous, repetitive. She says, I am told that we have come to the mills voluntarily and we can leave when we will. 
Then she says, voluntarily, so she seems to be disagreeing. She's being ironic. The whip which brings us back to Lowell is necessity. So that means need. Her family needs her there, or she needs to be there. She needs the job. We must have money. A father's debts are to be paid. An aged mother to be supported. A brother's ambition to be aided. And so the factories are supplied. So what she's telling us, she's telling us exactly where women stand, especially young women in those days. Okay, men come first. And then obviously, you know, your mother or, you know, the wife or so forth. Then next would be the oldest brother, the oldest male. And really down at the bottom with the least amount of opportunity, the least amount of choice, the least chance for an education or you know, the least chance to pursue their own destiny, pursue their own happiness, daughters, young women. Even when they eventually get married, those of them that would get married, they're then kind of like tied to their husband's destiny. So in those days, not a lot of women had the chance to really make their own destiny. And she f ends up with a couple questions here. Is this an act of free will? Is this freedom? To my mind, it is slavery. Of course, working in a northern factory was not exactly the same as slavery. Factory workers were not considered property, and they were paid for their work, even though that pay was generally pretty low. But what's more troubling is the fact that work like this still exists in the world today. It takes place in many countries, and sometimes even here in the United States. I hope that by learning a little bit about the life of a mill girl, will help you recognize that low pay, long hours, difficult working conditions, and brutal treatment still exists in the 21st century. And we have to deal with it. Thank you very much for joining me today on Much Ado About History, and until next time, be well.